Okay, today we're going to start talking about um, a newer atomic model. And, you know, a little while, a few units back, we kind of got the basics of the atomic model, and that's where we want to pick up from. And if you remember, the last person who we left off with was Rutherford. Rutherford's contribution to the atomic model was the nucleus. Um, but we still had some questions, and as a review, we had this very small positively charged center of the nucleus. And then we had these random electrons floating around because J.J. Thompson had already discovered the electron. But there were two very important unanswered questions. Number one, how were the electrons arranged? Was it really random? Was there a pattern to them? How were they around the nucleus? Um, secondly, what prevented the negatively charged electrons from being pulled into the nucleus, which is positively charged? And those were the two big questions that were kind of driving things at that point in time. And in order to kind of answer these questions and get there totally, we have to back up just a little bit. And we have to talk about light. Now before 1900, uh, most scientists thought light behaved as a wave. Okay, And down here you have a um, wave-like property, you know, with kind of a repeating pattern. And eventually what it happened is that we really had to start treating light like it also had particle-like characteristics. So the best way that I know for that to make sense is to think of this wave as being made of all these little particles. So it still may have some properties of a wave, but it also has some particle-like characteristics. And it's a little bit heady, but we're going to get there. Okay, first we're going to look at how light behaves like a wave. And first we have to look at what's called electromagnetic radiation, or EM radiation. Now for EM radiation, it's a form of energy that acts as a wave as it travels through space. Okay, now this includes a lot of different things that we're familiar with. You've got visible light, x-rays, ultraviolet and infrared light, microwaves, the radiation, not the appliance, um, and radio waves. And all forms are combined to form, or to make, the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and we're going to draw one of these in class and pay a little bit more attention to detail, but essentially it's ranked according to wavelength. Here you have the longer wavelengths and the short, much shorter wavelengths. Um, it also is based on frequency, which is how often um, Ooh, things pass a certain point, and we're going to define that here in a little bit, but you're going to have to be familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum, including the types of electromagnetic radiation, um, as well as how they're ranked according to both wavelength and frequency, but we'll spend some time going over that. Okay, now continuing as light as a wave, electromagnetic, all re electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light in a vacuum, okay, and that speed is 3.8 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. You guys may not remember, but this is Mighty Mouse, who was supposed to travel at the speed of light. Um, and when we say vacuum, it's not talking about the appliance that's in your house. It's just talking about um, an area of space that's devoid of any other matter there. And that's how fast the speed of light will travel. And that's going to be important. We're going to need that number here a little bit later. Okay, so continuing with the wave waves have repetitive motion. There's that, um, you know, wave-like property. And wavelength, which is abbreviated by this um, lowercase Greek letter, is defined as the distance between points on adjacent waves. And a lot of times we give wavelengths in nanometers, there's, um, which again, remembering our metric prefixes, there's 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. Uh, the other property of waves that's very important is the frequency. And frequency is defined as the number of waves that passes a point in, in one second. Um, and the unit on that is either 1 over s, but 1 over s is, always, is also equal to 1 hertz, which is um, capital H, lowercase z. Right? And again, they are in the, the two of these are inversely proportional. So again, if we remember, if they're inversely proportional as one goes up, the other goes down, and if we were to graph them on a set of axes, they would have this backwards J graph. Okay, so that part is going to be um, fairly important there. And we'll come back to this. And we've got this lovely equation, which 
as truth and pattern would hold. We're going to do some math related to those to that equation. So, but first, I just want to show you um, just a pattern of wave, and, and we'll do some demos of this in class as well, where the wavelength again is the distance between two points on adjacent waves, and violet light has a wavelength of 400 nanometers and infrared radiation which is just past red visible light it's going to be 800 nanometers so and again we'll when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum uh, we will rank different types of radiation uh, according to their wavelength as well as their frequency and have to know the order that they fall in okay so let's do some math problems well here is our equation and as always you will be given the equations you don't have to memorize them but we do have to know what they stand for now we have a lowercase c again on the last unit, they use that as specific heat or specific heat capacity. Now it's going to be the speed of light in meters per second, which, as we already learned, is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay, that's not ever changing. So you automatically know what C is no matter what, um, and which means you're solving for one of two things. You're either solving for the wavelength, which is typically going to be in meters, or the frequency that's going to be in seconds to the negative one, which is one over seconds, or hertz. Okay, either one, and you're going to see me write it that way. Um, if you're not super great at algebra, you may just want to memorize uh, the two versions of this equation. If you're solving for the wavelength, it's going to be the speed of light divided by the frequency, and if you're solving for the frequency, it's going to be the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So these really are the only two options that you're going to need, because you always know the speed of light, because it is still always 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Alright, so if we have our known and our unknown, well, our known is 310 nanometers, and that is our wavelength, which is that kind of upside down Y letter. Now the other thing that we know is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second is our speed of light. And we want to know the frequency, okay, which is equal to V. So we're going to have to eventually use our equation of the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. However, we have to do something first. The Wavelength unit, for, nah, excuse me, unit is in nanometers. Speed of light is in meters. So we have to convert nanometers to meters first. So I'm going to have 310 nanometers. And just like we said before, there are 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. So that's going to give us um, 3.10 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Okay, and you're going to see that frequency frequently because a lot of wavelengths are given in nanometers, particularly visible light, and, and we'll come back to that in class when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so I've got my equation. I've got my speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I now have my updated wavelength, 3.10 times 10 to the negative seventh, and I'm solving for V. Again, like I mentioned before, if you're not great at algebra, just go ahead and manipulate these, learn the manipulated equations ahead of time. You simply divide the speed of light by whatever you're given, and it's going to give you the unknown. So, showing you the long way here, 3.10 times 10 to the negative seventh. Divide both sides by that. Now, when we determine our significant figures, speed of light is a constant. It's a constant value constant, just like molar mass, just like Avogadro's number, so we have to use the data to determine our significant figures. Now, 310, the way that it's written, does not have a decimal place at the end of it, so it only has two sig figs. So when I do this math, my frequency is equal to 9.7 times 10 to the 14th, and remember my unit is either going to be hertz or 1 over s. Honestly, it does not matter. They're equal to each other. So you really could pick either unit and have that be just fine. Okay? All right. So let's do another equation, or the problem rather here. Um, this time, we want to know what is the wavelength 
in meters, all right, if of light, if its frequency is 3.2 times 10 to the negative second hertz, okay? Now again, just as a reminder, you don't necessarily have to write this every time, but we also know that the speed of light is 3.8 times 10 to the negative eighth. Okay, we've got our equation. Again, if you're lousy at algebra, if it just makes life easier, go ahead and manipulate it ahead of time. This is what I'm looking for. So again, if I divide both sides by V, I end up with the um, wavelength equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. So I'm going to take 3.0 times 10 to the 8th, divide it by 3.2 times 10 to the negative second. Okay. Now even if you just think about doing some mental math here to predict where it should come out, remember if I divide exponents, I subtract them, so 8 minus a negative 2 ends up being 10, because um, you end up 8 plus 2, so we should come out about times 10 to the 10th power, and what we come out with is 9.4 times 10 to the 9th meters, and the reason it doesn't come out to be exactly to the 10th is that we can only have one digit out front when we do scientific notation. And again, we had two sig figs in our original data, two sig figs in our answer. So we are good to go. Okay? All right, now, moving on with some more information stuff. Uh, the early 1900s, at this point, everyone thought that light was a wave. It was the wave. Okay? Now, in the early 1900s, two experiments involving light were completed that could not be explained by only wave theory. Okay, remember, a theory is simply an explanation, so they needed to update those explanations. And it actually took Einstein to get there. And so don't feel bad if it doesn't make total sense. But, okay, the first um, experiment was the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect happened when an emission of electrons came from a metal when light was shined on that metal. Now emission is just a fancy word for give off, emit, I don't know, it's just another word for give off or produce. So the more important thing is they took this light and they shined it on a metal and you got particles, okay, and so that didn't make sense. It was kind of like putting in apples and getting oranges. Um, and no electrons were emitted if the light's frequency was below a certain value. So there had to be something about the frequency of that light to cause those particles to be given off. And a lot of this is heady, and a lot of this I'm not expecting you to totally understand all the background, other than just expecting the conclusions and kind of the final results of a lot of these experiments and a lot of this work. So, um, so anyway, scientists could not explain with classical theories of light, so it led to the particle description of light. And again, the way that the best way I know to think of it when you're thinking about um, the particle theory versus the wave theory, is I think of a wave that's just made of a whole bunch of particles. And depending on the situation I'm dealing with, I have to think of it as particles or think of it as waves. Okay, so here's exact a picture of it. So here was your metal, okay, and the can cathode, and, uh, sorry, here was your anode that was continued your uh, circuit. Here was the metal plate. Okay, right here. <coughs> Excuse me. So in came the light. Came in this way and out shot the stream of electrons. So you had waves going in and particles coming out. Okay? And again, that was just a major departure from what they expected to happen. They expected these waves to come in and waves to come out, but they didn't. They got particles. So along came Max Planck, who's a German physicist, and he suggested that an object emits energy in the form of small packets of energy called quanta. All right, And we're going to see some things in class and see some other videos that kind of try to illustrate this packet piece, but it's really just that they have to be certain amounts. Okay, it's got to be certain whole, pa I always think of sugar packets, but you have to either pour it in as an entire sugar packet, not, you know, being able to break it in half or add a small portion of it. And if we define quantum, a quantum is simply the minimum amount of energy that can be gained or lost by an atom, and quantums have to occur in these packets. And it led us to another equation 